Heads up. Good afternoon et bonjour. Je suis ici avec le médecin en chef de service aux Autochtones, Tom Wong, et euh, la sous-ministre adjointe, Valerie Gideon, de service aux Autochtones aussi. Euh, je vous joins ici à Ottawa, du territoire traditionnel du peuple algonquin à Nishinabé. I want to begin by addressing the increasingly alarming situation in Kshashwan First Nation. At this time, we are aware of 232 active cases, a majority of which are among children that are 12 years old and under, those who are not eligible yet for the vaccine, or children 18 and under who are either had a first dose or haven't had the opportunity to get that first dose. Our government continues to work and urgently so with community leaders and other partners, including Meshkegawit Tribal Council, Winnebago Health Authority, and other federal and provincial government departments. This past Sunday, delegates from Indigenous Services Canada, the Canadian Armed Forces, and WAHA with the Winnebago Health Authority were on the ground in the community to perform further in-person assessments of immediate needs alongside community members and provincial partners. The collaboration between ISC and the Canadian Armed Forces and other partners is ongoing. And following a request uh, for assistance from the province of Ontario, uh, CAF will provide additional supports to Kashashwan. Uh, earlier last week, to further support the surge capacity and pandemic response, $453,000 in emergency support funding was allocated to Kashashwan. The additional funding will support food, supplies, transport, personal protective equipment, um, a pandemic response coordinator, quarantine officers, COVID-19 screeners and testing personnel, security and communications material. And th this funding is in addition to the $7.6 million that had been previously allocated to the community since the onset of the pandemic. An additional $4.3 million was also allocated to Meshkegawi Tribal Council to support the procurement, deployment, and operation of 15 three-bedroom isolation units to assist the community, uh, communities in the James Bay region generally, four of which will be deployed in Kasheshwan in particular. Meshkegawig Tribal Council has also been allocated $170,000 to mobilize crucial mental health supports for community members, which uh, includes, obviously, traditional healing. There are currently 15 nurses and three paramedics on site. This is a double the usual capacity in the community, and in addition, 10, sur 10 surge nurses are serving externally in support of the remote case contact management, which is so key in isolating the COVID cases. There's also, a surge of Waha nurses and physicians in the community, in addition to 15 Canadian Rangers who were deployed last week to assist the delivery of essential supplies and food. There is also a, a team of 16 Red Cross members in the community to assist with food distribution in particular, as well as to prepare further isolation units. Thankfully, uh, the high vaccination rate in adults with both first and second doses has provided a firewall for the most elderly and, as we know, thus the most vulnerable. But this does clearly remain an alarming situation. And for clarity in comparison to the rest of Canada with respect to active cases, uh, the cases in Kasheshwan form roughly a quarter of the active cases in Canada. We recognize that public health uh, responses to the outbreaks of COVID-19 remote isolated communities require the robust funding and support that we have deployed. And I have been in continuous communication with Chief Leo Friday as the situation on the ground evolves to ensure that adequate supports are in place as required. We remain committed to working with and supporting Chief Friday and Kshashwan in this difficult time. 
and we thank all those on the ground working tirelessly to support the community. Uh, I couldn't end this part on Kshishwan without saying the amazing work that they have done through the two flood seasons that uh, unacceptably uh, they have had to evacuate on uh, without uh, getting COVID. Uh, this is a testament to their resilience, but this is a difficult time for them and we will be there for them. Um, as well, I would note that this outbreak is perhaps a sad reminder that COVID is still here and is very dangerous, particularly if you have not been vaccinated. Now turning to case numbers and vaccination rates in Indigenous communities across the country. As far as the number of cases uh, as of June 15th in First Nations communities on reserve, we're aware of 889 active cases. This thus brings us to 31 1,163 confirmed pos positive COVID-19 cases since the onset of the pandemic. Um, there are 29,921 recovered cases and tragically 353 deaths. In terms of the vaccination numbers, as of June 5th, we are aware um, of 687 Indigenous communities with vaccinations underway. And based on Statistics Canada's 2020 population projected projections for those aged 12 and over, just over 75% of eligible individuals in First Nations communities have received at least one dose, and very importantly, 41% have received a second dose. If you extend that analysis to uh, communities in the territories, that means that 46% have received that critical second dose for total first doses of 75% as the previous number. Um, this is great news, but we'll keep on going uh, because we know there is so much work to do and particularly um, to protect those that are the most vulnerable, including the very young. We are seeing encouraging news from some provinces that continue to move up their timeline for eligibility for second doses. And last week in Manitoba, officials announced that all Indigenous peoples in the province are now eligible to book their second COVID dose, as long as they meet the minimum time interval between doses, of course. And last Thursday, the government of Alberta also announced that people who had received their first dose of a vaccine in April are now eligible to book their appointments for a second dose. Nova Scotia authorities are as well shortening the wait times between the first and second doses of the vaccine. In the Northwest Territories, with recent shipments, there are now enough vaccines to give two doses to every resident aged 12 and up. I'd also like to highlight in particular a new milestone for the Ontario Women's Native Women's Association, that they recently hit their Mindimuyen vaccination clinic, administered more than 10,000 doses of the vaccine to Indigenous peoples from urban areas in, in Thunder Bay. The Indigenous women running the mass clinics uh, incorporated their cultural and traditional practices to make the patients feel comfortable. And I'd like to thank them for their leadership and continued efforts. Cette pandémie a eu des répercussions importantes sur les communautés autochtones. L'une des façons dont le gouvernement a réagi à ces répercussions et par l'entremise du Fonds d'appui aux entreprises communautaires autochtones qui sont très fragiles. En juin dernier, nous avons annoncé le, le lancement du Fonds et des contributions financières non remboursables de 117 millions de dollars pour aider à soutenir les micro-entreprises des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis, ainsi que les entreprises communautaires ou collectives dont les revenus ont été touchés par la pandémie de la COVID-19 et souvent sont gérés par des femmes. Nous avons récemment renouvelé le fonds et nous y, ajout nous y ajoutons euh, 117 millions de dollars. Le fonds est destiné, encore une fois, aux entreprises qui ne sont pas admissibles à d'autres mesures d'allègement du gouvernement du Canada liées à la COVID-19. L'objectif est d'alléger la pression financière qui pèse sur les entreprises en ces temps extraordinaires, afin qu'elles puissent renforcer leurs opérations et être en bonne position pour la reprise lorsque les conditions, bien sûr, économiques se stabiliseront. En terminant, J'aimerais rappeler que malgré une hausse de taux de vaccination et un relâchement des mesures sanitaires, la pandémie de la COVID-19 n'est pas terminée. Nous ne sortirons pas vraiment de l'ombre tant qu'une vaste majorité des personnes n'auront pas été complètement vaccinées, incluant les enfants, évidemment, comme les événements de Kachachelouane en témoignent si péniblement. J'encourage donc fortement toutes les personnes qui sont éligibles à prendre leur deuxième dose dès que possible, J'aimerais également encourager les parents à amener leurs enfants pour qu'ils se fassent vacciner dès qu'ils seront éligibles. Jusqu'à ce qu'une vaste majorité soit vaccinée, s'il vous plaît, veuillez suivre les lignes directrices en matière de santé publique. Vous pouvez porter votre masque en public, éviter les grands rassemblements et lavez-vous les mains souvent.
cela fera une grande différence en vous protégeant, vous, votre famille et votre communauté. Miigwech, Nakumik, merci, and thank you. I want to uh, acknowledge that I'm on the unceded territory of the uh, Algonquin people. Over the past month, for those aged 12 and up in First Nations, Inuit, and territorial communities, the percentage of individuals who have received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine have increased from 64% to over 75%. And for the second dose, from 32% to over 46%. Indigenous leadership across jurisdictions, along with the local and provincial public health, continue the tremendous efforts in the rollout of vaccines, including clinics aimed at youth aged 12 and up. I know that we are all tired and ready for this pandemic to end, but we must remain vigilant as variants of concern continue to spread throughout Canada, in the north as well as in the south. Some variants of concern are more transmissible than others and have the potential to cause more serious infections. In order to get ahead of the variants of concern, we need a second dose of the currently available vaccine and to follow public health measures. Augmenter la prise de vaccin et respecter les mesures de santé publique vont aider à prévenir les hospitalisations, à réduire la propagation et à sauver des vies. Ceci permettra une relaxation graduelle des mesures de santé publique en accordance avec le contexte local. Now that the warmer weather is here, take precautions and enjoy the fresh air outside. Let's work together towards a summer with sun dances, ceremonies, and safer gatherings when it's safe to do so, supported by public health measures. Miigwech, Nakumik, and Marcy. Thank you. We will now take questions from journalists. One question, one follow-up. We'll start with questions from the phone. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Our first question, the première question, is from Dylan Robertson with the Winnipeg Press. Please go ahead. Have vous la parole. Hi, Minister Miller. I wanted to ask you about support for residential school burial site searches. Could you please walk me through a rough sense of three things? Uh, you know, the number of emails you've received, the cumulative amount of requested funding so far, and if you have a sense of a region where there's more of a focus on, you know, immediately doing these searches. Yeah, look, at the, Dylan, as you know, because um, you're covering these issues, this has touched every single Indigenous community across the country and, and triggered some memories that people thought um, had, they, they had healed from, and, and it really has opened up wounds across the country. Um, and in fact, you know, some of the most poignant testimonial that I've received from, uh, from leaders and Indigenous peoples generally is... Um, there are some people that still are not prepared to speak about their experiences um, because they have been so um, traumatic. Uh, and, and I think that guides leadership in their decision whether to take that difficult step of, um, of investigating sites. Um, so we have received, to answer your question specifically, we have received many emails from across the country, and I don't think there isn't any Indigenous community in the country that isn't thinking about this. Um, but how to proceed can vary in different ways. We've seen um, all the attention around the Tekem site. Um, we've seen other uh, discoveries in, in Brandon, um, requests from Six Nations, uh, but across the country. I've also gotten requests from chiefs um, that they are not prepared to do this, but where will we be when they are? And I think, you know, as we announce funding, and as we respect the TRC calls to actions to let the Indigenous communities most affected um, by these sites as they decide what to do with um, the deceased, the very young um, remains that are perhaps considered sacred and a scene that could perhaps be considered a crime scene, most certainly is in certain circumstances. Um, these are very difficult decisions that we have to partner with our provincial counterparts and territorial counterparts to say, we're here. We won't be pointing fingers at each other when you need us, 
And when you do need us, we'll be there for you with the financial support of the government of Canada or the provincial or territorial entity in question. I did a recent announcement with the government of Quebec to reiterate that to communities. Um, but we can. We, this really is one where we have to let communities lead or else we are betraying what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has told us to do. Um, I can't give you a sense of the cumulative numbers uh, that we have gotten yet. Um, they are large in some circumstances, as you have seen the public ones, um, but we are still getting a better sense of that and timing. And, you know, throughout the last few years, whether it's the Brandon site that has received funding for, as an SSHRCC grant or Heritage Canada money, we know that there has been um, work done, but it is very, very uh, painstaking and requires the proper procedures and, um, and cultural protocols. Um, you had that, a third point, I think I addressed when I said about the different reactions that people have had, but if I haven't, um, I'd be glad to follow it up in your, in your next question. And um, Minister, there, there, there's a growing concern over the lack of coordination coming from Ottawa because we have companies and volunteers offering to search sites. I know that the government says that this needs to be community-led, but we have experts that are warning that some of the evidence might be compromised or some companies could be taking advantage of communities. So I was wondering if you could respond to those concerns and if you have any sense of whether there will be at least an optional baseline guidance to sort of guide communities on how to not botch a site or get, you know, ripped off by a company. Yeah, and, and conscious of the fact that we can't sit near Ottawa and tell communities what to do, we do have a sense of what best practices are. There is a central point in government between mine and Minister Bennett's office, um, who has fair, formal carriage of this file um, through her mandate, but we were working across the civil service um, to reach out to communities and 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 keep a constant dialogue, um, not dissimilar to the constant dialogue that we have had throughout COVID, where uh, very much an, aver uh, an evolving set of um, of information that we have to continue communicating with each other. Um, but we won't tell communities what to do, uh, but we will uh, share best practices to the extent we know them, and um, and, and work with communities that want to go at their different pace. I mean, there are, there are issues of you know, some. Of these sites are situate on, on on private land. Some of them are on reserve. Some of them are on "quote unquote" crown uh, provincial land. So there, are, uh, it, it really depends on the specificity of the site. Uh, but what we've said with all our provincial partners is um, we're not going to we're not going to sit here and, um, and and prevent communities or, or or throw up red tape between our different levels of government to prevent them in in um, gaining a sense of the truth so that they can continue with um, with the healing. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Christy Kirkup with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Hi. Good afternoon, Minister. I wanted to continue down the same line of questioning as Dylan with respect to um, residential schools, and specifically uh, former TRC Chair Marie Sinclair recently talked to a parliamentary committee about the need for there to be an investigation conducted, particularly um, an eye toward crime that could have uh, occurred at residential school. Uh, beyond uh, the $27 million that is uh, being sent, as the government describes, on an urgent basis to communities to do some of this work, what, what about that call for an independent investigation to determine whether there were indeed crimes, uh, potentially murders of children uh, that took place at these schools? Oh, yeah, and Christy, it's not a question of being in against it in theory um it's a it's a question of allowing the communities to lead uh, and and it really is nothing without the full informed consent of the community and that is a difficult process um we've seen that you've seen that most pointedly in in in, in what's happened at the Kamloops site um and it has to be a very very um delicate interaction with um with uh, the investigative authorities um, knowing that sometimes, uh, as we've seen in the past, the trust is very, very thin. Um, so I understand the, the need for answers um, that will not be immediate, and I don't think the federal government would at all get in the way uh, of any, any proposed investigation. But it, we are very, very sensitive to the calls of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to allow the communities in question to have their voice and that nothing should be done 
without their consent. Christy, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Uh, um, Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond, uh, now the director of the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, has suggested that these are crime scenes and that any unexpected death, any unknown burial without documentation has to be treated as a crime scene. And she says that's international humanitarian law. So is there any concern on the government's part that perhaps, um, you know, work being done on, on the ground at the community level uh, could, could potentially um, uh, serve as interfering with um, those crime scenes? And again, there, these are these are tampering of evidence is always a concern. I think foremost for those who are looking for answers, um, and so I think that is why there is so much uh, difficulty and challenging in establishing clear clear protocols. I I I, I don't think any community would um, appreciate um, investigative forces coming in with yellow tape and putting them all up around uh, potential sites. Um, these are very, very sensitive issues, and they are potential crime scenes. Can't hide that fact that, that there is a corresponding search for truth that no one wants to see any tampering of evidence, I think, is that has guided our very, very delicate and sensitive approach, focusing on the communities um, for an closure, um, for answers, and ultimately, to your point, on investigations for accountability. It's why um, there has been uh, such uh, an intense interest on getting uh, full accounting of, of records. Uh, a great number of them have been given over to the Reconciliation uh, Center in, in Winnipeg, but there's a lot more answers out there that we haven't gotten yet. And I, I doubt we will ever get a full picture, but it certainly isn't complete to the satisfaction of those who do want more answers. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Olivia Stefanovic with CBC News. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Hi, Minister Miller. I, I want to ask you about the farewell speech that NDP MP Mamoula Kaka gave yesterday in the House of Commons, in which she said she, she doesn't feel like she belongs here in Parliament, and that she's often stopped by security in the House of Commons, and she feels racially profiled as an MP. I'm wondering what your reaction is to that, and how you think Parliament can be a safer and more welcoming workplace for racialized people. You know, it's, it's a reflection of... Um still who we are as, as a country, that um, that um, MP Kakak still feels that way. Um, she isn't the first person to say that. Uh, you'll recall that uh, Selena Caesar Chavan said that as well. She felt like she was getting carded, um, which comes with um, some very painful experiences that are all far too common for the black community and, and racialized people in Canada, Indigenous people. And that's happening at... Um, where she has parliamentary privilege, which is uh, the right and duty to speak on behalf of the people that she represents, uh, so too with MP Kakak. And um, it, it is a sad reflection of where we are. It's unacceptable, and it shouldn't be that way, yet it is. Um, MP Kakak has had very, very strong opinions. I, I respect those opinions. Uh, we have had differences, um, but they are differences that are important to growing our democracy. And for someone to feel unsafe in what should be the, one of the most secure places in the country because of who she are, is and who, what her identity is, is entirely unacceptable and, in fact, is an attack on her parliamentary privilege based on who she is and her identity. Olivia, do you have a follow-up question? Thank you. Yes, as a follow-up minister, I did have an interview with Kakak recently in which she said that part of the reason why she took a second leave from office was because of the dispute with Liberal MP Yvonne Jones. And I'm wondering if you have any regrets about how your party handled that situation, if you would do anything differently now looking back at that, 
and why your department continues to fund this organization that Jones is a part of that many people like Kakak do not feel that represents Indigenous people. I think, Olivia, you need to ask that question to Yvonne Jones, who has a, a deep and profound sense of what her identity is. Um, and I, it very difficult for a guy that looks like me to insert himself in a conversation between two people who um, are uh, are having a, a, a dispute over each other's identity, particularly given the role that I serve. So that's all the comment I'll provide on that. Thank you. We'll now take questions for, from the room. Hi, Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. Um, so uh, Chief Friday in Kesheshawan says that help has been slow in coming, um, that uh, he says uh, rangers haven't yet to arrive, and I think you said that they are actually on the ground. And that there was a screening and isolation program in place last year that the funding stopped for in March of this year. And I'm just curious if you could explain uh, any of those things. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the rangers are on the ground. I, I, I think in all these situations, we always ask ourselves uh, whether we can go fast enough. Uh, you know, COVID moves faster than, than the government. Um, and throughout, the, whether it's the, the, the scary, scary spike in wave two in northern Manitoba, where we just cut through all things and, and, and got the military out, got support out. Um, we keep assessing and reassessing how we can go faster. Um, despite all everyone's best efforts uh, and given the, the, the despite the, the, a resilient and courageous community, um, it is a very fragile community that has had at times very serious discussions about relocation that we continue to support. There is a lack of housing. And when you look at that from a pandemic perspective, all the conditions are there for spread to occur. Um, this is a different situation, though, than what we saw under wave two um, and even the first wave where we had no vaccine. So there is a there is a firewall. And now where we've seen is what we expect from an epidemiological perspective, things to, ha to happen, which is people that aren't immunized get infected. That has spread like wildfire. And indeed, it should be a warning signal to any community that has, a, has an aggregate immunization rate that is lower because of its low high um, youth population that could apply to Nunavik that could apply to Nunavut it could apply to a swath of indigenous communities across country it's why we're so careful in ensuring that communication is open and continuing the public health guidance um, so when it does happen we'll be there for the communities and we will continue to be there for the communities um, there this will be a difficult week for Kasheshwan um, but there is a real surge of capacity and and, and resources getting in um, as to the as to the testing they have had uh, to the best of my knowledge um, and glad to correct that publicly if I'm wrong, uh, constant testing capacity. But I think Val um, can speak to that in more detail if you want more clarification. I can just say that um, the request for assistance for Canadian Rangers was started on June the 1st. So they have had Canadian Rangers on the ground. They currently have 14 in addition to one instructor. And we've had a consistent amount of uh, extra surge capacity support on the health side. Even last week, there were 24 uh, health staff that were there and uh, right now we have 15 of our nurses at the departmental level, three contracted um, uh, paramedics. The Winnipeg Area Health Authority has also three nurses, two physicians, two mental health providers. That's in it. And we have the Canadian Red Cross that has 16 people on the ground. They've been uh, really supported over the last few weeks uh, quite consistently. In terms of testing, we have had swab testing at the nursing station in Kishashwan since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Uh, they have an Abbott ID rapid testing machine that is operational there as well. Uh, we had funded the Winnebago Area Health Authority uh, really at the beginning of the first wave. $6 million for medical equipment. $1.8 million of that was specifically targeted to Kishashwan First Nation. So we had a surge capacity support available to the community since even prior to the outbreak. Um, on the UNDRIP legislation, there was attempts in the Senate last night to amend it. Conservative premiers, I believe six of them, have uh, written to the Prime Minister expressing concerns about lack of consultation. Knowing that the bill probably won't have the desired effect if the provinces aren't entirely on board, what do you think has to happen at this point? I, I missed that. But the, you said under, it was and The UNDRIP bill, yeah. And, and Conservatives are worried about lack of... <laughs> 
the conservatives say that there's conservative premiers that are saying that they did not get consulted on the legislation and they would like to be consulted. And so the conservative senators. Yes. Who are part of a party that oppose it are now. I'm just asking the, you I'm what you think has to. Pattern, it, I'm just asking you whether you think you need to consult with premiers on a legislation that they have to help implement. Okay. So it, okay, not, not on. Okay, no, not on conservative senators that are part of a party that has openly voted against. Under, oh, I, so I get the question now. Um, I get the question now. Um, Minister Lametti and, and Minister Bennett have had um, a swath of conversations with with, uh, with with premiers, and they have registered their um, their objections at times. Uh, these are these are views that that we respect. Um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People has. Um, important symbolic and concrete statements that in the world words of Willie Littlechild will finally put Indigenous people at the same starting line where they haven't been up to now in our history. Um, it's not the be all and end all. It, 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 it doesn't do it, it, it doesn't do things that people wish it would do uh, and apparently it does um, it does way too much uh, than than at its very minimum, it actually purports to do for the particular party that is objecting to it. Um, it will be transformative in the way we look at our laws. Uh, there's a whole implementation scheme that needs to come after it. And this is where the hard work will start once it passes. I have confidence that we'll pass, and I do have confidence in the Senate. And, and even the, I hope the Conservative senators see it, see it in that in that perspective, um, because I think it it it. it it's a testament to the fact that we need all parties on board for this, and not all of them are. It's about transforming who we are as a country. So um, it, it is a starting point and a key starting point, a, a, a linchpin of, of the, some of the calls to action, but then how we reform the laws, including one of the most difficult ones that we always get called to task on, which is the Indian Act. Um, but it is, the, it is, in my mind, the very be the beginning of a process where Indigenous peoples are at least afforded the, the same point at the, in the starting line. Um, so I, I really, I respect, we have to respect the Premier's views, but um, we also hope that they follow the example of their British Columbia counterpart, which has preceded Canada in implementing UNDRIP um, with some difficulty, as you've seen over the last year. So it, it, it isn't the be all and end all, it's a starting point and a very, very important starting point as part of um, a very difficult and long linear path of reconciliation. Thank you, next question. Uh, hi, Minister, Jordan Gowling, CTV News. Uh, my first question is, so far the plan has been to send uh, Moderna vaccine shipments to the Northern Territories and to most First Nations communities. Uh, what will be your plan to get Pfizer vaccine shipments to First Nations communities so that 12 to 17 year olds can get their shots? So they're already, it's, good, it's a very good question because from the very get go, um, following up on our priority to get uh, uh, immunizations and, and vaccine doses into northern remote communities, Moderna was the most viable logistical option given that the Pfizer had to, had a very um, difficult manipulation, you know, how to deal with it in ultra low freezers and such. That indication's changed. So we're getting, we already have um, Pfizer deployed for that uh, 18 to, to 12 category in, in northern communities. So there's a whole logistical plan in place to get that in as quickly as possible. But it's, it's very uh, salient to the point that we've I've been discussing all morning in and around Kasheshwan because though that, that is Pfizer and that is the only one that is recommended for that age group up to now. Um, we hope that the other ones will get approved for lower age groups as well. But right now that is the only option. I, I think, do we have a breakdown of, do we have a breakdown of numbers of Pfizer? We, we don't have a present, but we do. I mean, the Pfizer's in the communities and it's, it's currently being deployed. And as I mentioned in my speech this morning, um, the NWT has enough doses of Pfizer to fully administer that to the, 12 and over group, but it, excellent question. And, and on that note, um, to supplement to what uh, the minister just said, um, you know, the fact that uh, Pfizer, you know, now uh, one is able to actually use Pfizer uh, and keep it in the fridge, you know, for a month, uh, whereas previously uh, it's quite uh, restricted because of a minus 80 freezer. Uh, that 
uh, absolutely opens up, uh, you know, the flexibility of using that uh, in both the territories and uh, northern um, indigenous communities. And as a result of that, uh, all provinces and territories have been working with uh, indigenous communities to actually uh, use more and more of uh, Pfizer, uh, together with uh, Moderna as well, uh, in the north. Thanks. And uh, just to follow up on your earlier comments about the Nunavut MP, um, what do you think it says about your government's work on reconciliation if even an elected member from Nunavut doesn't feel she belongs in the House of Commons? Um, you know, it, it, I, I, I think it's tragic that she feels that way. I think we should all feel um, feel badly that that's the case. Uh, this is her, in, this is, is her opportunity to be the voice of her people. Um, and that that is the case today, as I answered previously, is is is, is really unfortunate. I think I think she's been a very. I mean, she she has achieved a lot uh, as 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 the voice of her people, and, and I think fundamentally, uh, I, I I do wish her well. Um, but that I think is it's important to realize that that is the lived experience, as has previous MPs have. Um, have have so eloquently highlighted uh, it, it isn't acceptable and, in, and indeed it's probably a violation of their privileges as, as members of the House of Commons that they um, don't feel they're being treated equally. Thanks. Next question. Mr. Miller, Mike Lukutur with Global National. I want to ask you uh, back to Kesheshawan. You mentioned that this will be a real difficult week for the community uh, because as you said, COVID moves faster than the government. So is that, am I to take that to mean that it's going to get worse before it gets better there? So we, we've moved up, Mike, to, um, it was, when I spoke to you yesterday, we were at 216 cases, we're at 232, that there's been a, a, a slight climb, not as dramatic as, um, as other days. Um, it is principally among that youth category, 18 and, and under, 12 and under, that haven't had their vaccine shots. Um, you know, when it comes to, to younger segments of the population, you can't just take one kid and put them in one unit. There's issues in and around parental guidance um, that we have to be very, very sensitive to. Isolating them, conscious of the fact, in some cases, that they're in households of, 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 of perhaps a dozen or more, uh, with the potential for spread. The fact that we had a high vaccination rate is um, of some comfort, but um, given the fact we don't know the long-term effects of COVID, particularly on the youth, um, it, 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 it still is and remains alarming. But with the procedures in place and with the sanitary measures that we're and, and the surge capacity that we've deployed in the community, um, we know that while the course of the virus has to, you know, work its way through those that are in, that are infected, there's you know a critical seven-day period where, um, if there needs to be medevacs, we'll do it, um, or if people can, if they're asymptomatic, they still need to be isolated. Um, but it is a delicate operation and, and, and frankly, very traumatic for a community that um, has, has, has a lot of challenges. And I acknowledge that you, you had said that, um, you know, there is a lot of infrastructure and resources that you're pouring into the community and you're in constant discussions with uh, the leadership there. But what has to happen to trigger a more fulsome response from the government to possibly sweep in and create more of a firewall than just the vaccination rate that's there? Uh, like. At what point does Ottawa go, we need to go uh, and, and send a lot more to this community to prevent even further spread? Yeah, and, and it's, it's something that we assess and reassess on, on an hourly by, a basis, Mike. Um, currently, right now, um, the, there, for the immediate health needs, there are no outstanding requests, but we stand ready for you know, general duties within the armed forces to, to step that up, help with, with setting up larger isolation domes, um, helping th people through that, 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 that difficult period. Um, when you start, this is a community of a little um, over 1,800, perhaps more. Um, so when you get to that area, as we saw with Lalosh, we're 10% of the community. Again, it's a different, different comparator, but very on, we had an issue with Lalosh, no vaccines there. Um, but you start to see communities shutting down. Um, because people are isolating um, and they need they need food, they need sometimes people to help the, with the water plant. Um, they need uh, if nurses get infected, uh, they need the um, they need the help to 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 to, man, to, to staff the nerf, nursing station. Um, these are all things that are completely assessed and reassessed on on more than a daily basis. 
and, 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 and we'll stand ready to be there for them. So it, it, it is a staged approach. Ultimately, um, we know that, that vaccines are uh, an important solution, but they're not the only one. The public health guides and the tr tried and tested approaches of tracking, tracing, and isolating. Right now, it's a question of tracing and, and, and isolating, and having those structures in place will be, um, will, will be game changers. Um, but again, there is still uncertainties with respect to how the vaccine operates, whether people having it can they themselves spread. Um, we know that they are less eff efficient vectors, but it's still a question mark that remains hanging over um, everyone's heads. Again, these are we're dealing with high, uh, relative to the Canadian population, highly immunized communities among those that are eligible. So it, it's a learning point for us as we start to look at other communities that potentially remain vulnerable, and that's work that we're doing in, inside the inside the government to have resources there if and when that does happen. Some communities with higher groups of unimmunized have had outbreaks, but they've been able to control it. I'm not in a position of really pointing fingers. We just have to be there for them and work with the other levels of government to, to step up. As you bring those resources, though, will vaccination rates, are you attempting also to sort of flood the community with vaccinations so that we can continue to protect them? Yeah, I mean, we continue with that effort, but again, um, I'm sorry. It's always funny sitting beside a doctor and I'm talking about medical things, but it, <laughs> it, it, you have to wait, you know, about 20 days before uh, there's a robust immune response. But I think Tom can speak about that. But we are doing that, yes. Um, uh, and uh, the vaccine uh, is demonstrated, uh, even during this uh, current outbreak, very effective, uh, close to 90% effective in, in uh, stopping infection in uh, Kashashwan. Um, uh, just uh, to put it in, uh, uh, um, you know, statistics um, for individuals who's uh, unimmunized uh, in uh, the community, uh, we are seeing a, an attack rate or an instance rate of infection that's uh, eight times that of uh, people who are immunized. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, the vaccine, uh, you know, works very well, but it's not the only thing that, you know, that works all the social determinants of health, you know, and all the public health uh, uh, measures. As the uh, minister, uh, you know, just said, uh, you know, we uh, need to actually look at over the next uh, uh, week to see, uh, you know, the epi curve, to see whether there's a flattening of uh, the uh, epi curve. At this point, it's uh, too early to say. Thanks. Thank you. We'll now turn back to the phone for questions. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, our prochaine question is from Geneviève Normand with CBC Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Have the parole. Oui, bonjour. Merci de prendre ma question. Bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre. Je voudrais revenir sur la situation à Keshawan. Vous avez dit que les Rangers étaient déployés. Est-ce que vous avez prévu, est-ce que vous prévoyez avoir recours, par exemple, à l'aide de, de l'armée dans la communauté? Euh, oui, ben, en fait, a, les Rangers, c'est l'armée. Euh, il y a eu un, une reconnaissance physique qui a été faite euh, dimanche, toute la journée, euh, pour faire le tri des besoins qui, étaient, euh, qui, étaient, qui restaient à souvenir encore. Euh, on attend tout simplement euh, la réponse de l'Ontario pour l'instant pour pouvoir déployer l'armée euh, dans une plus forte présence pour aider avec des... Euh, avec, avec des, des, des euh, de, de, de l'aide supplémentaire, que ce soit pour monter des tentes, pour faire la distribution de nourriture pour les gens qui s'isolent. Euh, il y a déjà beaucoup d'effectifs de déployés au niveau de la, la, la Croix-Rouge euh, ou de l'autorité euh, régionale Winnebago, euh, mais on sera toujours là pour les aider. Euh, pour l'instant, il, il y a des tentes qui ont été déployées, mais là, il y a des dômes qui vont être envoyés aussi pour aider euh, dans les prochaines journées. Et ça va prendre des bras, donc euh, okay. c'est ça que l'armée va faire. Um, si, si vous me permettez de reformuler ma question, est-ce que vous prévoyez en, dans ce cas-là avoir un déploiement militaire, disons, plus imposant que euh, la quinzaine, je pense, de Rangers qui sont, qui sont déjà là? Alors, euh, si je peux reformuler ma question. Et en relance, je voudrais savoir si vous pensez que euh, le manque de logement, le fait en fait que plusieurs familles soient euh, vivent sous un même toit, le fait qu'il y a de la transmission communautaire parce qu'il y a une crise du logement. Pensez-vous que c'est un facteur qui contribue à l'éclosion euh, qui a lieu en ce moment? Bien, absolument. La, le fait qu'il y ait 16 personnes parfois qui vivent dans, dans la même maison, ça, ça, ça empêche la capacité de réduire le facteur de, propaga le facteur de propagation même, voyons, propagation en dessous de 1. 
euh, parce que ça, ça, ça se répand à l'intérieur de la communauté et surtout avec les jeunes euh, qui ne sont pas immunisés ou qui ont juste simplement une immunisation partielle avec une première dose, ça l'empêche. On, on le dit depuis le tout début, c'est la raison pour laquelle, une, 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 peut-être là ou une des raisons principales pour laquelle euh, les communautés autochtones sont, règle générale, 3,5 à 5 fois plus susceptibles de contracter la COVID et euh, d'en subir des séquelles plus importantes. Et, et, et c'est ce qu'on constate depuis le tout début. C'est la raison pour laquelle on a dû aménager des, euh, des, que ce soit, euh, soit des gymnases ou des écoles euh, pour pouvoir aider avec l'isolation euh, et, 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 et les efforts qui sont déployés dans les communautés autochtones diffèrent radicalement des efforts qu'on doit déployer dans les communautés non autochtones. En, en, en raison, ben, la raison principale, c'est... Euh, le sous-investissement en capital, notamment ce qui a trait au logement. C'est la raison pour laquelle le budget avait une si forte euh, proportion d'argent de, 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 euh, qui a été dédié à l'infrastructure parce qu'on sait euh, qu'il y a un, un gouffre socio-économique qui reste dans les, dans les réserves, notamment, et, et ce, euh, dans ce cas-ci, dans les, dans, dans les infrastructures en logement. Keshechewa en, en est un exemple. Ceci étant dit, ils ont, euh, la communauté a, 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 a vraiment réagi très bien face euh, aux inondations euh, anticipées l'année dernière et cette année, et ce, euh, à moins d'indications contraires, sans COVID. Euh, mais ici, il y a quelque chose qui s'est glissé et puis ça s'est propagé comme un feu de paille. Thank you. Next question. No further questions registered at this time. Thank you. I'll turn back to the room if there's further questions. Nope. Wonderful. And that concludes our press conference today.